It's always a pleasure to welcome back to Los Angeles the very capable managing editor of American Opinion Magazine, speaking on the composition of the United Nations, Mr. Scott Stanley. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a magnificent party, and we have dined tonight in the grandest ballroom in America. But we Americans are skin flints compared to the high rollers whose bills we pay at the United Nations. According to Pulitzer Prize winner Fred Sparks, there are over 2,000 UN parties each year, costing altogether some $10 million. That's $192,307.69 a week. A typical little party was given recently by the UN delegation from Sierra Leone, costing a mere $12,000. Sierra Leone is a tribal country in West Africa with a per capita income of $125 a year. But the local dictator, a person called Siaka Kingfish Stevens, <laughs> tries to keep up with the U.N. PAC. Last year, the United Nations itself spent $200,000 on such fancy entertainment. That's quite a sum for an operation that's $230 million in debt. Even the U.N. High Commissioner for Refugees reserves $11,000 a year for partying. He asked for an extra $1,200 last year for a cocktail party or two with the refugees in Saigon. Meanwhile, the U.N. lounge is operated as a brothel to keep the party going. When Omar Adil was Sudan's ambassador to the U.N., he was charged in a paternity suit on the day after he had made an impassioned address to the U.N. General Assembly on the perils of the population explosion. <laughs> the ambassador claimed diplomatic immunity. As did another UN diplomat who, longing for the jungle rivers of his native Nigeria, was hauled by police from the Hudson River when he was, where he was found swimming in the nude. Jerome Pintos, a UN economist who is a Greek national, is another diplomat who found immunity helpful. Mr. Pintos has two wives. It is bigamy, of course, but as long as he is with the UN, Jerome Pentos has diplomatic immunity and can have 100 wives uh, if he has the energy to woo them after putting in an exhausting day at the UN. <laughs> the United Nations is a sinkhole of such madness and contradictions burbling from one bizarre assertive absurdity to another. Consider its very composition. There are 132 members of the United Nations, each with one vote in the General Assembly equal to our own. 132 members, of whom practically all are anti-American and most are Marxist. These august member nations range from the Maldive Islands, population 108,000, whose chief sources of export revenue are bonita fish and the sale of postage stamps, to Red China, population 700 million, whose chief source of hard currency is illicit heroin, pumped into the United States to destroy our sons and daughters. Some of these nations, each with a vote in the UN General Assembly equal to our own, are so obscure that simply to locate them on a map requires a 10-power magnifying glass and a PhD in the geography of the obscure. I ask you to think for a moment. Where are Bahrain, Botswana, Burundi, Togo, Tonga, Upper Volta, uh, the capital of which, incidentally, is Ouagadougou. <laughs> Gabon, Gambia, Mali, Oman, Rwanda, Sri Lanka, Gutter, Zari, and Chad. And don't you feel secure knowing that such vast, civilized, and important nations have a vote equal to that of the United States of America in the UN General Assembly. 
What these UN members do or don't do affects you, and you must not remain ignorant of their higher civilizations. The peace of the world depends upon it. The very survival of man may depend upon what our UN ambassador says to the UN ambassador from Gabon in some time of international crisis. And far too few of you are taking this matter as seriously as you must if we are to avoid being incinerated in hurled bonita fish and catapulted coconuts. Another neighbor is Zari, a UN member whose senior satrapper, Mabutu Sesi Siku, was elected president for life in May of 1970 by 30,495 more votes than there were registered voters. <laughs> Yet another president for life is Jean Bedel Bukasa of the UN member nation known as the Central African Republic. In 1971, Bokasa celebrated Mother's Day by ordering the execution of all men jailed for crimes against their mothers. But what crimes were not specified? Oh, there are all sorts of highly civilized members of the United Nations. Ladies and gentlemen, an equality of membership in the United Nations with such primitive societies is an absurdity of such ludicrous proportions to make the anatomy of a giraffe seem reasonable. Their, re their leaders style themselves by names like Mobutu Sisi Siko, which means he who knows no fear and suffers no defeat in the jungle, King Natari V, Mwami Mawambutsa IV, King Mo Shu Shu II, and other contrivances that range from exalted ruler of the universe to head hippopotamus and president for life. They include diapered gurus given to worshipping cattle while their people starve, goat-keeping date gardeners in bed sheets, night-shirted aborigines with bones in their noses and hair keys to the point of terror, and assorted dish-lipped baboos from peanut palaces where civilization has not yet risen above the eating of human flesh. There are 132 members of the United Nations, each with a vote equal to that of the United States. A few are civilized countries seeking idealistically to find peace. Most are tin-pot dictatorships based in miserable little fiefdoms that make the black hole of Calcutta look like the grand ballroom of the Century Plaza Hotel. The rest are communists. <laughs> what is happening is that we are being outvoted at the United Nations in what Alfred Lord Tennyson called the Parliament of Man, the Federation of the World. Those lines from Loxley Hall constitute the only known proof of Carlyle's criticism of Tennyson that it is a shame he did not think up to his own towering style. Consider what it means to embrace the communists in a parliament of man. We are speaking, after all, of the greatest mass murderers in all history. We now sit coyly in the United States, for instance, with the butchers of red China, placed there by the perfidy of our president to the cheers of the UN's cannibal kingdom. Red China's UN representative, Mr. Huang Hua, now a vice president of the United Nations, was during the Korean War in charge of Mao's brainwashed torture of American prisoners of war, 5,000 of whom were murdered with their arms wired behind their backs. According to a recent Senate subcommittee report, he and his fellow Red Chinese gangsters have butchered nearly 64 million of their own people. When that august assembly sits in the UN chambers with such monsters as the Red Chinese, in the name of peace, it is a wonder that the just God who filled the rivers of ancient Egypt with blood does not drown them in a tidal wave of gore. Consider the toll of these 
peace-loving communists with whom we sit in hypocrisy at the United Nations. In their takeovers, the communists have murdered 50,000 Albanians, 100,000 Armenians, 5,000 Bulgars, 5 million Belarusians, 7 million Cossacks, 100,000 Crimean Tartars, 900,000 Croatians, 15,000 Czechs, 100,000 Estonians, 200,000 Georgians, 1,759,000 Germans, 100,000 Hungarians, 500,000 Kulmaks, 150,000 Koreans, 100,000 Latvians, 100,000 Lithuanians, 100,000 Macedonians, 1,500,000 North Caucasians, 100,000 North Vietnamese, 1,200,000 Poles, 64 million Red Chinese, 150,000 Romanians, 9 million Russians, 300,000 Serbs, 50,000 Slovaks, 12,000 Slovenes, 400,000 Spaniards, a million Tibetans, a million Turco-Tartars, 7 million Ukrainians, and on, and on, and on. These are the monsters who sit, soaked in the blood of their millions of victims, in that parliament of man that disgraces our shores. Ladies and gentlemen, there are so many reasons to get us out of the United Nations and the UN out of the United States. All are sound and reasonable and compelling, but the best still seems to me to be the hauntingly ugly facts of its bizarre comp composition. For the United States of America, the greatest nation in all history, to sit down in a Byzantine parliament of man with mass murderers and dope pushers and pygmies and assassins and pathetic creatures in loincloths only a generation out of the trees is worse than sinister. It is ludicrous. If this sounds like chauvinism, fine. So why do we fight we Americans who care to get us out of the United Nations and the UN out of the United States? It's as simple as this. We do it because we love and respect our own country. In the beginning, we were lovers who had not found our thing to love until we opened our hearts and our eyes and saw our own great country for what she is, being human and flawed with the dark passions of man as well. We were also haters who had not found our thing to hate until we looked to the east and saw the millions of corpses stacked like cordwood under a blood-red banner and smelt the stink of murder rank for a thousand miles. No one had to tell us what to do. All that we loved and hated was locked in a battle to the death. We joined that battle not because we relished it, but for the same reason that a mother rushes into the street to save her child or a bridegroom runs into a burning building to save his bride. We worked for our cause. And we found as we labored, as men always find, and as women always know from the beginning, that our love was far, far greater than our hate, and swallowed it up, and made us in the end soldiers of God, striving to be worthy of our own American heritage.